You know, the great minds of science and art and other fields get a lot of playtime because they were inherently creative and innovative in their respective fields. But here's the thing, I don't think it's because there was a lack of creativity or a lack of innovation from thousands of other people around them. I think back to my time in large corporations, working in them and working with them, they often called for more creativity, more innovation. Why can't we be more creative? Why can't we be more innovative? And it's not because of a lack of expertise. It's not because of a lack of smart people working there. I think in large part, you get into these situations and it's effectively management by committee. And as everyone knows, committees will kill anything inherently creative or innovative. And it's awfully easy to simply rely on the attitude of, well, we've always done it that way. Or we've tried that before and it won't work. And the more people you add to an equation like that, the less likely it is that you'll see open-mindedness and willingness to take a risk or try something different or stick something out for a long, st stick with something, uh, stick it out for a long time. Right? because we're looking for shorter term results and not everybody has the same level of vision. I think vision plays a really important role in innovation. You not only need that visionary to help kind of guide you to where you need to be, but you need them there to encourage you along the way. And sometimes we see the road to innovation or creativity is cut short because the main instigator behind it moves on and there's no longer that executive support there. So I think there's a lot of factors that go into play when we think about the culture of creativity and the culture of innovation, particularly at large organizations. And in this episode of Timeless Leadership, I think you're going to enjoy the exploration that we have with Jim Webb through a variety of entities and individuals and how they approach innovation. Stick around. Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? Dolly Parton said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership, principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the first century. This is Timeless Leadership. Hey there, welcome to Timeless Leadership where we explore principles and virtues that accompany successful and admirable leaders. I'm your host, Scott Monty, and I hope you're listening to us on whatever podcast catcher you have and that you've subscribed to us there. Uh, we release new episodes every other week. We're in season three now. This is the 12th show of our third season. And uh, make sure you're signed up to get updates either through the Timeless and Timely newsletter, where we'll send you an email with the show notes whenever they go out, or again, through whatever podcast listening platform you prefer. And if you wouldn't mind subscribing to Timeless and Timely just as a regular newsletter subscriber, I typically dot that publication with my thoughts on leadership and reflect on some of the greats in history and literature and philosophy 
to kind of give us a new vision on their take and how the old really applies to the new once again. Dr. Jim Webb was educated at West Point in engineering and leadership. He graduated with honors from Ranger School and earned the coveted Green Beret. He since received an MBA, an MS in engineering, and a doctorate in innovation. Jim served as an R&D engineer for Texas Instruments, as the chief strategist for two global corporations, and managed a $6 billion pension fund. With firms like Price Waterhouse, Deloitte, and Kearney, he has two decades of consulting experience in strategy and innovation. He's a noted scholar on Sherlock Holmes and a member of the Baker Street Irregulars. And he's currently a professor teaching strategy and innovation at Southern Methodist University. Jim Webb, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Scott, it's great to be here. Well, I can't tell you uh, how uh, surprised and thrilled I was to see uh, the subtitle of your book, Innovators Who Changed the World, Timeless Leadership Lessons from West Point, Green Berets, Sherlock Holmes, and Wall Street. Um, Obviously, the timeless leadership portion attracted my attention. Um, But of course, you and I also have this common interest in Sherlock Holmes. So that was uh, another nod as well. So what what actually drove you to uh, create this book and use the examples that you did in it? Uh, Interesting question. So the reason for the creation of the book is I was going around here in, in, in Dallas and in the, in the state of Texas for the most part, uh, you know, giving a, a speech to, you know, rotary clubs and companies and different areas. And at the end of the lecture, they go, that was great. Um, where's the book? <laughs> well, I didn't have one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so okay, I, okay, it's time for me to sit down and write it. You know, so over the summer, I only was teaching one class at the, the university. So I, I went ahead and, and, you know, wrote it, uh, got it to a decent editor and uh, got it cleaned up a little bit and then uh, got it published. But the, the real, the, the emphasis behind the book is all of these institutions that have really shaped me as a person. In other words, I lived in these worlds. And, and I, the more I dug into them, the more interesting they became to me. You know, when you go through uh, for instance, when you go to West Point, you go and you're mostly struggling just trying to pass physics, right? Yeah. But when you look into the history of all the people who graduated from there and, and the way that it was founded and the way that it's kind of worked its way through all the different challenges that the, the United States has had over the years, you, you, when you research all that, you start to have a huge appreciation for you know, who all the contributors, if, if I might say, all standing on the shoulders of all these giants who managed to create such a great institution. So, yeah, I mean, you're a regular Isaac Newton, you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, when, because I, I've gone through a similar journey myself, just reflecting back on experiences and my education and whatnot and finding more appreciation now than I did when I was going through it, how much of a uh, a, a time of separation did you need, and how did you actually start to to draw those strands together? Well, it, it's interesting. You know, when you're working uh, in in the world, as it were, in, in non-academic areas, you just tend to, tend to put your head down at work. In fact, you know, the last job I had before I, you know, retired and, and went to work at the university, become a professor, I was running a six billion dollar pension fund. I had no time to do anything. You're know, getting up early, <laughs> seeing the markets, staying late, checking the trade. You know, it was yeah. it was pretty brutal, as you know, sixty hour, seventy hour weeks kind of stuff. And then at some point, though, you kind of have your life takes a pause. And I know you've gone through something similar lately as well, but uh, you you have a pause and you kind of reflect back on all the things that you've you know kind of learned over the years and. And, uh, and especially when you're teaching students and they keep asking questions. Um, and then you, see, then you say, wow, you know, there's, there's a lot here. And so when you do that, then you start to look into it a bit more. Maybe read a book or two on the different areas 
And then the, after you just, and then if you're a PhD type like I am, you start researching it, right? That's what we do. Oh, we have to research, you know. And so I uh, started diving in deeper and deeper. So that's uh, kind of how it all got started. Yeah, and that's interesting because one of the things that you uh, mentioned in the chapter about uh, Wall Street, leader, leadership lessons we can learn from Wall Street, is that particularly with uh, J.P. Morgan as the figurehead there, it's really about identifying trends and quickly adapting based on what you learn. And the essential part of all of this is communicating this with your stakeholders along the way. Yeah, I think, and it's very interesting in that one of the things that I, one of the trends that I've noticed as, I, as I've gone through this journey is that, you know, in, in uh, academic circles, they talk a lot about transformational leadership and transactional leadership, transformational being, you know, the Elon Musk and the Stephen Jobs of the world who have great big visions and drive people toward their visions and keep painting these clear pictures of the future. And then you have the transactional leaders who have to make them happen. Um, that's more like managers who, who yeah, they have a limited amount of resources and they have to do with those resources what they can and just be as efficient as they can. But what I'm finding is the situational leader is pure gold. Uh, in other words, they, they are capable of doing both. You had J.P. Morgan, who in, in that particular instance, who was able to, he understood the nuances of the New York Stock Exchange. He knew, knew understood the nuances of banking. He knew everybody in the banking world. And but all at the same time, he had a clear picture of when things started going south, you know, getting everybody together and negotiating something amongst them. And he obviously had the panache to be able to do that. And he and quite frankly, he locked everybody in a room until they came to an agreement. He was famous for that. But, um, it, you know, he and, but he understood everything. And so he was more of a situational leader. In other words, he could he could go down and understand the small little nuances of of all the transactions, and he could also immediately shift to the big picture. And one of the things that I found interesting is, isn't that what the great CEOs do? You know, the great CEOs are the guys who are able to walk through the factory and say hi to all the people on the shop floor and see what's going on, then walk up to their executive suite and be able to make the bigger decisions, understanding all parts of the business in detail. And that those those people are gold. There's not many of them. Yeah, you're really... Uh spot on with that. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, leadership like that in my time at Ford Motor Company. Uh, you know, we had a, a visionary executive chairman in Bill Ford. Oh, and yeah. he at one point was CEO and stepped aside, realizing that he did not have that kind of transactional and even situational uh, leadership capability that was necessary and brought in Alan Mulally. And Alan was an engineer by training and knew all the transactional stuff, but he really stepped it up to that level of situational leadership. Uh, he, he had the trust of everyone at the organization. He was uh, friendly. He was about building relationships. He was about recognizing the expertise on his team and about collaboration. And I think that that notion of trust is something that I saw pop up again and again uh, throughout your book. Uh, you know, we just talked with Stephen M. R. Covey in the last episode about trust and inspire. Same kind of themes here, particularly when you talk about your experience in uh, the Army Rangers and the Green Berets. You want to uh, expand upon that and maybe talk about your uh, insights there from the Army? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. There are, um, of course, there's different parts of the Army and they have different values. If you, if you look at, say, the conventional Army, um, it's mostly, you know, kind of a, the ch very chain of command driven, take orders, do what you're told, et cetera, et cetera. But then there are people within the uh, service who are in uh, are very, very special groups. Uh, the Army Rangers and the Green Berets certainly both fit into that because they, they're, they're much more highly trained. Um, you know, to be an Army Ranger, you have to go through Ranger School, which is uh, a couple months of just sheer... Uh, challenge, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> you know, you, you, sp you spend the last uh, three weeks, you know, waiting, you know, through the Florida swamps in the cold, you know, so just to, just to you know, take the measure of the man. So when you get out and you look at somebody and they've got a ranger tab, you know that person, what he's capable of doing. And so mm -hmm. there's an element of trust to start with. And then the ranger units themselves really come together 
uh, you know, because of the esprit de corps that they have and they, they, you know, they, they're very, they challenge themselves. They constantly, um, you know, work well with each other. And then, and the Green Berets, on the other hand, is, is different because most Green Berets have gone through ranger training. And, but then they've also, they have to go through cultural training. They have to go take, speak a couple of foreign languages. Um, they have to go through a specialty training in like, uh, you know, like the light weapon specialist can take apart and put together just about every weapon in the world because you never know where you're going to be. Uh, the, the medical training, uh, the medic on the special forces A team can do everything except operate on the head, chest, and abdomen unless I, as the detachment commander, allow him to do so because it, it's, it, you know, the guy may die if he doesn't, right? And so they're high, all these people are highly, highly trained. And so when a special forces A team, you, you drop 12 a 12 man a team into a situation they um you know they're able to to understand the culture because they've studied it they they speak the languages because they they went into isolation and they only spoke that language for a while and they and they've studied the re- the bios of the guys that they're linking up with because typically they work with um people in in foreign countries uh to conduct uh you know revolutionary warfare guerrilla warfare and I, I, there's an excellent book written by it was a marine actually who said the difference between like the way a Marine uh, company would handle, let's say there's a village and they're being harassed by the enemy, right? A Marine company would come in and they roll in with their, their tanks and their armored personnel carriers. And they say, okay, we're here to protect you. We're going to surround the village with our people. And then we're going to, you know, make sure that uh, nothing happens. But by the way, we can't let you leave because we don't know who's helping the enemy and who's not. And so it's, it's kind of a classic, um, you know, build a fence around the town. Well, a special forces unit shows up day one and it's the commander and his radio operator walk into the village in, in a very dignified way and request an audience with the village elders. They do it speaking the language of the villagers. <laughs> Mm. And they understand the cultures. They're not going to offend anybody because they know the cultures. They're not going to do something silly. Then they say, we want to help you defend yourself. We are here to help you. There's only 12 of us. It's not like 100 people are going to surround the village. We want to train you. We want to help you. We want to provide you equipment if you need it to be able to really help yourself. And so it's a very different type of soldier. But you know what? It takes forever to train a Green Beret, too. It takes a year on average. To, to really get them up to speed. Yeah. That makes sense because, I mean, the level of preparation and expertise that you're talking about it doesn't come just by, you know, studying a, a, a manual or the back of an envelope calculation. I mean, this is deep immersion. And, and, yeah. and when it's fewer numbers of people going in, the way you're describing, uh, this is really a leadership that doesn't, obviously doesn't uh, overwhelm with force it's not a command and control kind of thing it's really about uh, a coaching mentality you are training uh, the rest of the the village or wherever you happen to be and enabling them and isn't that what a good leader does you know you're you're exactly right if you can you know those because when you leave those people have learned skills They've, they've got a greater confidence in, in, in each other because they've worked together to be able to build a freer society. Uh, they've, they've, they've been able to, you know, get rid of the enemy for the most part so they're not bothered anymore. And they know that if they come back, they kind of know what to do. Um, so I, it's, it's, it, it, it just builds trust not only within the village or the country, but it also helps the United States because they, they knew that they, they had friends in the United States. So it's all... Uh, you know, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, shifting uh, thoughts a little bit here, um, I was really intrigued to see the story of Jigoro Kano in there, the father of Olympic judo. Mm-hmm. And and I know that's a particular interest of yours as well. Talk a little bit about um, the the influences of... Uh, of Kano and of uh, perhaps of Japanese culture in getting to that point. Yeah, it, well, it, it, I started studying judo when I was like 10 years old. So I've been doing it my whole life. Um, so obviously it had, and it, to, it, me initially it was just a cool sport. It was fun, you know, it was, 
you know, it's one of those sports that, um, you know, it, it, it's a lot of hard work. It's one of the most aerobic sports in the Olympic movement. But I, you know, for the longest time, I just went out and competed and had fun. And But then, once again, when you pause and reflect and you look back on how did Jigoro Kano get to where he was, it's an amazing story. In other words, here he was. He was a small for his age, asthmatic kid, but he's a highly intelligent. And so he would, uh, he, he, he came from a wealthy family. They, got, they, had a, they had a sake brewery, which is, you know, close to my heart anyway. But um, he, <laughs> I know I had to throw that. <laughs> but uh, so he, but he got sent to boarding school. Well, when you go to boarding school, you know how those shenanigans go, right? So he's there. He's a really smart kid. He's small, asthmatic-y. And so he gets bullied by all these larger kids. Well, fortunately, he had an uncle who was, uh, you know, a samurai at one point and, and knew jujitsu. So he showed Jigoro Kano some jujitsu moves. And all of a sudden, he's empowered, <laughs> you know. And so he thought this is the coolest stuff in the world because now we can fight back against the bully. So he started getting really um, involved in studying jujitsu. And, he, and he, he got so involved, he mastered one style. And usually people kind of master one style and they, they call it a day. Well, he decided, wait, I can learn from these other – because every jujitsu system has their own techniques that uh, they teach that are, that are all different and, and – effective in their own ways. And so he started studying and he became a master in several other different styles. But all this was happening um, during uh, the, the beginnings of the Meiji Restoration. I don't know if you see the, the Tom Cruise Samurai movie that came out years ago, but it was, it was a period of great, it, there's a period of great change in Japan where American ships are in the harbor and uh, all of a sudden um, Japan is kind of forced for the first time to not just be its own little island. They're starting to trade with the outside. Um, and then all of a sudden, the samurai who were basically in charge of, under the shogun, were in charge of Japan, ruled Japan as, as military leaders. All of a sudden, they're not as important. And so they kind of started to get downgraded in their importance. And all of a sudden, the mercantile uh, people started to get a lot more important, and they started getting elected to the diet uh, within Japan. And so a whole different government comes along. And as the samurai kind of died out, uh, they some fell into disrepute because they got mad because you know they lost a lot of their status. But um, you know, as, as, so so did the, the ways of the samurai, and so did the uh, the jujitsu styles that are affiliated with the different samurai clan. Well, Jigoro Kano said, you know, this is a shame because there's some good. I remember when I was a kid and this empowered me. So what I did was what Jigoro Kano did was he, he, put, he put together his own style to where he used the, uh, the best techniques that he'd learned. And, that, you know, instead of being the not invented here syndrome, he was the opposite. He took whatever he could that worked and put it into his system. And then it, what was interesting was... You know, he built and built and built. And, of course, he was, at the time, he was teaching at a, uh, at a you know, a, a high school and a teacher's college. And he was actually, at one point, teaching the emperor's kids. I mean, so he was a, he was a smart guy. <laughs> he had connections yeah. everywhere. Mm. And um, so he, you know, every, he was admired. But he put together this new system. And so it became more and more and more popular. And then one day, the Tokyo Police Department's like, hey, you know, um, you know, we don't, we want to have our policemen who don't carry weapons to have the best um, techniques possible. You know, when they when they come in and they get into altercations, and they were so they studied kendo, but they also studied a non-weapon oriented martial art. And so one day they said, "Okay, okay, everybody stop bickering. We're going to have a big tournament here to be able to determine uh, who's the best style for the Tokyo Police Department to study." And at the end of the so big huge thing, um, they you know, they put up their jujitsu guys put up their best fifteen guys, uh, Jigoro Kano's Kodo Kan Judo put up his best fifteen guys, Jigoro Kano students won twelve lost two and tied one, so wow. it was a good day uh, <laughs> yeah. for them. And so all, now he's a uh, his style is you know now it's being taught in the Tokyo Police Department. And still now if you go to the Kodokan, which is the world headquarters for uh, uh, judo. Um, 
the Tokyo Police Department has a, a area in there where they still train, you know. So, um, but it, and with that, it became, uh, you know, more and more accepted, more and more practiced by people throughout the country. And at one point, he says, you know, the world has brought us a lot of stuff. Um, one of the things that they brought, which unfortunately led to the demise of the samurai, was uh, uh, weapons, you know, guns and yeah. uh, things. And so it became much easier to train a peasant with a firearm than it did to a samurai who took a whole years and years and years of training to use a samurai sword, right? So that was another reason that kind of accelerated the downfall of the samurai. You didn't need him anymore. You could take, you know, and some of these peasants with their firearms were becoming heroes on the front page of the, you know, Tokyo Shimbun, right? Yeah, um, I mean, you know what was interesting too, though? So first of all, uh, you know, the samurai... Um, tradition that was something that was largely uh family based wasn't it? it was kind of hereditary thing it was it was very they had their uh they had you had your daimyo who he was kind of the head of the family and he led like the tokugawa family he ended up controlling most of japan and having the tokugawa shogunate which is the one that was eventually overthrown but you're yeah. right it was it was family and it was honor and it was loyalty and it was um, you know, studying, you know, balancing your character with by studying arts and reading and also yes. practicing the martial arts. And so Kano said, this is all valuable stuff and it's going away. Yeah. So he emphasized all that. And Kodokan means school of learning the way, by the way, because um, you notice it's judo, it's not jujitsu. There's Jews at the beginning of both, which is just means the flow of energy between two people. But do, jitsu is like techniques. Do is the way of life. And he wanted to give judo the way of life of all this and then he said you know the world has brought us so much they brought us all this new technology and all this stuff i want to give judo to the world so he started sending out people all over the world to teach he sent uh, people to uh, london he sent people to europe um by the way the the and one of the guys from london actually came to and studied at the, the kodokan in japan for a while went back and formed Bartitsu in the, in London, so you you know where that's going, right? And for Sherlock, but, for non Sherlock Holmes fans out there, Sherlock Holmes, uh, when he well, it's a long story, but let's just say he faced off against Professor Moriarty, purportedly dying by falling over the edge of the Reichenbach Falls, was brought back ten years later by Arthur Conan Doyle, and in his explanation, he said he learned what he called the Japanese art of. Baritsu, which of course we know as Bartitsu. So uh, very much in the style of uh, what we would expect from a leader of his caliber, uh, understanding the, the uh, concepts of, uh, of Judo. Exactly. And so, so Kano sent these people out. The other famous uh, piece the person that he did, I don't know if you've heard of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's been very popular in the United States. That's a derivative of Judo. A guy, Matsu Maeda, went to... Uh, Brazil, he was teaching it, and a guy named Helio Gracie, um, to, he, he said, well, look, I, I don't like all this standing up throwing stuff, but I love all the groundwork you're teaching us. And so he formed his own stock because he his theory was, is my understanding, was that in Brazil, most of the fights in, in end up like in a bar, in the mud and in the the blood in the beer, right? And so he wanted to learn how to fight on the ground. So he took the judo techniques and he emphasized them on the ground and that became Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And then the next thing he did was he took advantage of an existing infrastructure to accelerate judo to the world and that was the Olympic movement. Mm. So he uh, he founded the uh, Japanese Olympic Committee. He trained people to go to Paris. Of course, they were last in every match, but that took, you know, in, in track and field is all they had at the time. But he's, he's planted that seed and kept nurturing that seed, and other people finally got it in the Olympics in 1964. So he identified an infrastructure. He sent people out, disciples, if you will, out around the world. Um, you know, he was a smart a smart professor who, uh, it, once again, you, you brought he brought together all this skills and talents to be able to really truly bring something i think is a gift to the world yeah and i think that's something we see um not only in every example you've got here but in every good leader it's not just about being an expert in one field or mastering one thing it's really about bringing a lot of things together and uh, you know kano you know in terms of uh focusing on character and life balance and what we know now as leadership rather than management 
um, keeping an open mind about things, you know, willing to take in new information and process it. And ultimately, uh, that kind of uh, tenacity, you know, <laughs> willing to stick with something. Because innovation, as you know, Jim, doesn't happen uh, overnight or even over the course of uh, months or even a few short years. It takes time to yeah, how get many this light bulbs, in place. How, how many light bulbs did Edison have to come up with before one worked? Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. exactly. And and what you're talking about, the, the building the precepts, the foundation here, that's something that actually factors into uh, the chapter where you talk about Sir Alex Ferguson in terms of uh, football or what we Americans might call soccer. You want to talk about uh, some of his leadership lessons for, for Manchester U fans out there? Man- Manchester United, yeah. I know they, they are much loved and much hated throughout the world. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because, because, well, there are very much loved and much hated because there are very strong football rivalries in, um, in England and Scotland, where, where my, my family comes from. But I mean, you don't want, for instance, I'm, I, I follow the uh, support the Glasgow Rangers, and you do not want to be wearing a Glasgow Rangers uh, shirt <laughs> and walk into a Celtic bar. <laughs> it will be bad things will happen. Well, that's why you, you know? need to know judo, right? <laughs> <laughs> you might you might be onto something there. But uh, Sir Alex Ferguson actually, you know, Manchester United was a very storied team, and mostly because. At one point, um, you know, they were they were the leaders in starting to go compete in Europe instead of just competing in England. And, um, you know, what had happened is they were coming back from Europe to, to because the, uh, the football association in England wasn't real keen on people going off to Europe. They just really wanted to promote their own footballs in a football league in, in England. So they had to hurry back to England to have a game the next day after competing in uh, Europe. And so they refueled in Munich, Germany, and um, un- unfortunately, it was the, the weather was really, really bad. And after several takeoff tries, unfortunately, on the third try, the plane crashed, and uh, all, most all of the first team, except for Bobby Charlton, was totally wiped out. So the entire first team, Manchester United, gone, something they'd built for years. Um, but the good news is the leadership of Manchester United, Matt Busby and others um, came together and rebuilt Manchester United and you know very quickly within a couple of years they won the uh, uh, the Football Association Cup which is the big tournament that they have in the England there's three big titles in English football the Champions League title which is all, winning all of Europe the FA Cup which is the big tournament and then the actually winning the league so this is the three things they go after and they came back and they won they did well in the league uh, just through great coaching and, and kind of moving forward, and they ended up winning the FA Cup in a couple of years. So, it, but after Matt Busby retired, it, Manchester United just started to be terrible, and so no coach could come in and do anything. Well, they got this guy from Scotland. Um, he was up at Aberdeen, Scotland, where it's really cold, and he came down to Manchester, took over Manchester United, but he was a strong, strong disciplinarian. And he walked into the room and, you know, there's people smoking, there's people drinking beer, nobody's in shape. And, oh, my gosh, did he change things around at Manchester United. He, he got them, you know, stopped, he stopped the drinking culture. He started using, you know, healthier, healthier techniques to be able to train them. He used more intense training methods. Um, you know, he brought in their own medical people so that they could keep an eye on the players, make sure they didn't do anything silly. You know, like like trying to hide an injury, you know, but, you know, sometimes, yeah, I want to play, I want to play. No, you sit out today so your injury heals, right? So yeah. he he brought together a whole bunch of new techniques to Manchester United, and and he he ended up being the, uh, the coach of Manchester United for 25 years, which is unheard of in any sport. That's incredible. And at the same time, he, one year he won what they call the treble, which no one else has done, where he won – the European Championship, the FA Cup, and the league all in the same year. Um, it's, and that, think about what it takes to do something like that. Because while other people are just, you know, just playing the league games on Saturdays, you're playing a game on Sunday, then Wednesday, then Saturday, because you're in all these different competitions. And so it, it's, it takes a lot to be able to do that and win all three. So, But he yeah. did it. And one of the things that um, 
really intrigued me about his leadership style is uh, in uniting the team and and <laughs> ironic that it, it, you know Manchester united um before he got there they really weren't united as a team they were a lot of individuals playing together and um it, so many strains uh, reminiscent of the coaching and the attitude and the leadership that you see in Ted Lasso i don't know if you've uh, Oh yeah, I love that. I love that show. Same kind of concept there. And one of the things to me that was really interesting about Ferguson's um, management style, leadership style, was um, penalizing people for um, for the their their behavior against their team members. In other words, you know, not speaking out against your team members and then holding people accountable, and not the person, but the criticizing the behavior instead. And, and he would go beyond that. And you're right. He did not. He never criticized a person. But he always, you know, but, but you, what we as good leaders know is you, you never say, you know, you suck. Or, or, or. You, you say, here's the behavior that I noticed. Don't do that anymore. Right. So that way you're criticizing the behavior, not the individual. Um, it's just a leadership skill that everyone should kind of learn. Well, he was good at that. But at the same time, if somebody's ego got too big on the team, he traded him to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Roy Keane, Rude Van Nisselrooy, probably everybody knows who David Beckham is. <laughs> well, when David Beckham, you know, started doing underwear ads and the, you know, the, the you know, in, in the tabloids and all this kind of stuff, and he's running around with the posh spice, and he was literally his ego was too big to be a good team member, and so David Beckham, every, everybody loved David Beckham, traded him to Real Madrid. Because you know what? It wasn't helping the team. Yeah. He was focused on the team. Well, it, uh, again, to uh, take a nod to Ted Lasso, it's not about being one in a million. It's about being one of 11. And Perfect. Yeah. That's where the focus needs to be. So um, so when, when you think about all of these uh, leaders that you've brought together or institutions and individual leaders that you've brought together under the banner of innovators who changed the world. Um, what's, what's one kind of uniting leadership tenet that you can take away from all of them? Because I, I know they each have, you know, different ones that uh, you've managed to pull out. But if, you had, if there was one uniting factor here, what would you say it is? You know, I think it, it has to do with, um, well, the uniting factor is probably a constant yearning to learn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we know that Ben Franklin, his entire adult life, he, he read a minimum of an hour a day, right? Warren Buffett, you know, he, he spends like six hours a day reading newspapers and corporate reports. Bill Gates, 50 books a year. You know, Mark Zuckerberg goes through at least one book every two weeks. Elon Musk, two books a day, according to his brother. And Oprah, Oprah Winfrey says, you know, books from my past to personal freedom. And, you know, the Oprah Winfrey story is pretty amazing. She came from nothing, and now she, I believe she's the richest woman in the United States because uh, she, she came from a very dirt-poor family. Well, now, now that uh, Queen Elizabeth passed away, she may be the richest woman in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. You might be right. But all these people, you know, Arthur Blank co-founded Home Depot two hours a day, you know. So um, all these people, they constantly read, they constantly learn. And one of the things that I see when I was consulting, and I was a strategy consultant for like 20 years, um, one of the things I found was people kind of stopped doing that. They, you know, there's two variables that you have to constantly look out for if you're going to be successful in business. One is you have to constantly be looking at the markets, not just your company, your customers, but future customers, where your customers are kind of going, new entrants that may come in from somewhere and have some new revolutionary idea, and, and keeping a, a, an eye on that market requires constant, constant diligence. The other end of the spectrum is all the technology that is out there that you can apply. Now, by, by technology, I mean, you know, the wheel was a great technology. Every, when you, yeah. These days, you say technology, it's computers. No, it's not computers. It's anything that makes life better, right? So you have to constantly be looking at how can you, what tools and techniques do I have out there that I, I can make my life, somebody else's life, my company, my products better. And when you merge those two things together, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of constant reading, constant research, but that's what the successful people do. That is spot on. Um, 
you know, leaders are readers, as the uh, the cliche goes, yeah. and um, that that spirit of uh, constant learning. And, and wasn't it uh, Sherlock Holmes himself that told us, "Education never ends, Watson. It's a series of lessons with the greatest for the last." Which is why you and I follow him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim Webb, thank you for giving us these timeless leadership lessons. Uh, the, the book is Innovators Who Changed the World, Timeless Leadership Lessons from West Point, Green Berets, Sherlock Holmes, and Wall Street by Dr. James R. Webb. You can find him online at BreakthroughStrategy.org. Jim, thanks so much for sharing your insights with us here today. Scott, it's been a real privilege. Thank you. The more we learn, the more we have an opportunity to innovate. And good leaders know that innovation means bringing others along, playing the long game, and having an attitude of continuous learning. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, may you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you are a leader.